got it. And then we have to see over here that we got it. All right. <clears throat> and looks like it's going. Come back here. Admit. All right, I'll start the recording to the Zoom, to the cloud. All right, welcome everyone to our next Water Wetlands and Watersheds seminar. Yes, looking good. Today we have virtually with us, you're, are you in Fort Pierce, Mesa? I am, yes. Okay, so from Fort Pierce and like from the bottom of this swimming pool is Dr. Lisa Krimsky. <laughs> She's a faculty member with uh, the UF IFAS Extension and Florida Sea Grant Program. Lisa is part of a team of five water resources, uh, regional specialized agents located across the state to lead and support the water resources extension education programs. Lisa's efforts primarily focus on water quality and harmful algal blooms and coastal and estuarine ecosystems. And her programs help solve water resources issues that are critical to the economic development and environmental protection of Florida. Lisa received her PhD in marine biosciences from the University of Delaware and her BS in environmental science and policy from the University of Maryland. So Lisa, thank you so much for doing seminar with us today. Um, go ahead. All right, great, thanks for having me. Let me pull up my screen. <clears throat> All right, can you see it? Perfect, yeah. Okay, great. So um, thanks for having me today. I'm excited to be presenting to you all. And I'm going to be talking um, about a series of projects that we've done looking at harmful algal bloom management preferences in Florida from various stakeholder perspectives. And you can't have a talk about harmful algal blooms without sort of providing that necessary precursor of what algae are and that they're not all bad. So um, I'm going to try and there we go. So start off talking about what are algae. They are um, a diverse group of aquatic plant-like organisms. They are capable of photosynthesis like true plants, but they lack many of the defining features such as true roots or leaves. Um, they can be unicellular phytoplankton, means that they live within the plankton um, or the water column, or they can be multicellular uh, macroalgae, uh, more commonly referred to as seaweeds, which are primarily found on um, the benthic um, habitats, although we do have the only holopelagic seaweed, uh, the sargassum seaweed, which we often see sort of washed up on our beaches. And they can be found essentially in any aquatic environment. So in um, saltwater, freshwater, brackish water, everything in between. But because they need light to photosynthesize, phytoplankton are primarily found at the surface. When we're talking about harmful algal blooms, we also have to recognize that this umbrella term often um, includes the cyanobacteria, which are not algae at all, but are in fact um, photosynthetic bacteria. So they're defined by their unique combination of pigments. Um, and in fact, it's one of their pigments, the phycocyanin, which actually gives them their name. Uh, phyco meaning related to seaweed and cyanin, the color blue, which is also why when you see a lot of these cyanobacteria blooms in the decomposition process, they sometimes have this like crazy intense blue color. Um, it's because of their unique pigments that allow them to perform oxygenic photosynthesis. Um, they are also, like their algae uh, counterparts, they're also morphologically and ecologically diverse and too can be found in all aquatic systems, including soils, ice, um, and even in extreme environments. So that's algae and cyanobacteria. And it's important to recognize that they are ecologically essential and are um, responsible for life as we know it on planet Earth. So cyanobacteria are responsible for generating the oxygen in the atmosphere that we now depend on. And with uh, their phytoplankton counterparts are responsible for generating about half of the total global oxygen supply today. So as much um, per year as all of the land plants combined. They're also, because of their photosynthetic capabilities are responsible and really important for carbon sequestration. Phytoplankton absorb about one third of the carbon dioxide that's produced globally and actually removes it from the atmosphere, bringing it into the ocean and then ultimately to the sea floor um, through their 
you know, when they die and sink. And so they're key mediators of global climate. Um, they also are our primary producers and are responsible for the majority of aquatic food webs. Um, as you can see in this image here, the primary production capacity of phytoplankton in our global oceans. And then again, are also responsible for nutrient and pollutant removal and um, are able to um, sort of transform and recycle elements that are needed by other organisms as well, which again is why they're so pivotal for um, life as we know it in the aquatic habitats. So this talk is about algal blooms and harmful algal blooms. So what are, what are they? Algal blooms um, essentially are the rapid and substantial increase in algae biomass in an aquatic system. And they are part of um, you know, normal ecosystem functioning. Um, algal blooms can become harmful, but not all algal blooms are harmful, but a harmful algal bloom is defined as that concentration of algal biomass that either produces toxic or harmful effects to human health or the health of the aquatic ecosystems. Um, it's estimated that there's about 30,000 to 1 million species of algae and less than 1% of all algae blooms uh, bloom forming species produce toxins, but of those we have quite a few in Florida, we have more than 50 hab forming species. So just as sort of this really general overview, harmful algal bloom um, forming species, they can be either planktonic, again in the surface column of the water column, or benthic on the bottom of the aquatic environment. They can be unicellular phytoplankton, or they can be multicellular macroalgae. They can be toxin producing, they can be non-toxin producing, but still be harmful. Or to complicate matters, such as some cyanobacteria, they can be toxin producing, but depending on the conditions, they may or may not produce toxins at any given time. So we, when we're looking at sort of harmful algal bloom management because of this diversity, really it's very complicated and it's not a one size fits all scenario. That being said, there are some real general factors that do determine growth of algae. Um, so because they are photosynthetic organisms, including the cyanobacteria, they require sunlight. They do require nutrients, macro um, macronutrients that we're most familiar with are nitrogen and phosphorus and some micronutrients. Um, these nutrients can be found internal in the aquatic system or they can be external to the system and be transported into downstream through um, weather events, heavy rains, stormwater, or um, hydrologic um, functioning. Temperature is important generally, especially when we're talking about cyanobacteria, warmer temperatures do promote faster growth. But as I said before, we can find algae and cyanobacteria in snow and ice. So it's not a limiting factor, it just does encourage growth. And then also time. So because an algal bloom is this accumulation of algal cells and biomass, you need to have time in order to constrain the algae which is why we oftentimes see algal blooms in slower moving portions of a river, in sort of the shoreline portions of lakes, um, in canals and stuff like that, because it actually, rather than flushing out the, the algae, it allows for that concentration of biomass. And in general, harmful algal blooms are a natural process. Um, they exist in areas where there is not a lot of human influence, but persistent blooms may indicate that there is an ecosystem imbalance. And generally that ecosystem imbalance has to do with the nutrients. There are other confounding factors that influence blooms, primarily complex chemical, physical, and biological factors. Um, such as water clarity and water column stability, again, having to do with photosynthesis, circulation patterns, uh, salinity preferences, hydrology, um, long-term climate and short-term weather patterns, and then biological community interactions, such as, you know, predation. Um, and overall, in order to have a bloom, you need those factors that promote growth to be um, 
greater than those factors that promote loss. So why do we care? Why are we talking about HAB management? Why are we talking about harmful algal blooms at all? And it's because of the negative impacts that these blooms do have. And so uh, primarily when we're talking about marine harmful algal blooms, we refer to them um, in regards to the syndrome that they um, inflict on humans through the consumption of contaminated shellfish or fish. And you can see that there's a diversity, diversity of toxins and syndromes associated with these algae species, but that they're not necessarily distributed consistently across the globe. Um, you can also have exposure pathways through aerosolization of these toxins. We're probably most familiar with that through um, the Karenia brevis red tide that we have in the Gulf of Mexico, where we often experience coughing or respiratory irritation, runny nose, itchy eyes, because the toxins can become aerosolized. They can be recreational contact uh, through, you know, swimming, water sports, other, and so dermal toxin. Um, issues for fresh waters, particularly the cyanobacteria, they can have impacts to drinking water supply. Most notably back in 2014, we all have heard about, you know, the Toledo River, um, the Toledo water supply having to be shut down because of cyanobacteria blooms in Lake Erie. And then there's been a lot of sort of recent um, concern about the potential impacts of contaminated water being used for irrigation and the impacts to agricultural crops. There's also wildlife and ecosystem impacts. So notably because of that large concentration in algal biomass, you can have uh, reductions in water clarity, which then can either cause low dissolved oxygen in a system when all that biomass dies and decomposes, um, or you can have on top of that, the large biomass actually blocking out all of the sunlight, creating a lot of turbidity and preventing um, photosynthesis for submerged aquatic vegetation. Both of those can lead to either SAV die off or fish kills and other wildlife kills. You can have smothering of uh, the benthic macroalgae and then those longer sort of cascading trophic effects such as um, the unusual manatee event that we're experiencing in the Indian River Lagoon for the past 18 months, where essentially we see these brown tides, um, even though they're not a toxin forming species, they have completely eliminated any sunlight penetration, have caused a reduction of up to 90% of the seagrass in certain areas. And then that seagrass being the primary food source for manatees is resulting in starvation. And then of course, for anyone who lives or recreates um, or works in those areas, you have those serious socioeconomic impacts um, due to, um, you know, closures in, in fisheries, uh, reductions in coastal property values, the human health costs, so, um, impacts to water supply, tourism, et cetera. So when we refer to HAB management, generally we look at two different um, opportunities. The first being prediction, and this is, can either be modeling, um, using sort of biophysical processes to understand how severe or intense a bloom is going to be. And then forecasting is using that modeling information and adding weather, circulation, wind type of information to be able to provide short-term forecasts as to where that bloom is going to go and how severe um, it will be. There's also response, um, which generally can include what we term PCM, this is prevention, control, or mitigation of harmful algal blooms, where prevention is really defined as proactive measures. They tend to be long-term measures that can um, reduce the extent of future harmful algal blooms. Control is the direct um, reduction or containment of existing blooms. And mitigation is defined as minimizing the impacts of an existing bloom. And so that can be something as simple as, um, you know, closing down a shellfish fishery um, or having signs, notices that, you know, there's red tide in the area and that you might experience respiratory irritation. Or it could be something like cleaning dead fish off of a beach to mitigate some of the economic impacts. Um, response also involves impact assessment. And so that assessment being 
assessment of public health, ecological, economic, social impacts of HABs and everything that that encompasses. And then also infrastructure. And this is sort of the tools and technologies needed to be able to do some of that mitigation. So maybe like a real time um, toxin analysis or something like that. And so traditionally, you have the research community who does the research to be able to develop these tools. Um, you have the response community who takes that research and then implements some of those tools. And hopefully some of that gets filtered down to those community stakeholders so that they have, um, you know, effective information maybe to, to reduce some of those impacts. And so effective, um, you know, prediction and response programs, they have to be based off of this thorough understanding of those complex biological, physical, chemical aspects of harmful algal blooms. But it's being recognized more and more that you also really need to be able to include the human dimension of harmful algal blooms if we're really going to have a successful management plan. And so this slide is adapted from um, the harmful algal bloom research and response to human dimension strategy. And it's recognizing the incorporation and the need to incorporate these diverse social sciences, such as communication sciences, humanities, behavioral sciences, and other interdisciplinary studies like epidemiology or perhaps um, urban planning in order to have successful management plans. And they highlighted six key areas for research within human dimensions that are necessary for successful harmful algal bloom management. So it's um, research on socioeconomic impacts, public health impacts, impacts to recreational and drinking water, risk communication, coordinating approaches, and then education and outreach. And so ultimately, by incorporating all these, you sort of change that model where you have more two-way input where the research community and the response community are actually collectively working to identify together to identify not only data gaps, but management gaps to have an informed um, management response that also incorporates the values, perspectives, and needs of those community stakeholders. And in doing this, you can have um, sort of have a better effective allocation of these limited resources to prevent and mitigate not only the harmful algal blooms, but the impacts associated with those blooms. And so we have a lot of harmful algal blooms in the state of Florida, recognized again that we, you know, we have more than 50 species. Um, this map is completely non-comprehensive. It's essentially just to show you that, um, you know, any, basically any fresh salt or brackish water system is likely going to have a HAB, but that, that HAB forming species, um, you know, there's a diversity of them. But most of this research really, the impetus was the 2018 algal bloom events, uh, the cyanobacteria bloom that started in Lake Okeechobee and then got uh, through discharge, regulatory discharges impacted the coastal estuaries on the Gulf and Atlantic coast. And then the red tide event um, that lasted you know, 16 months and impacted all three coasts. So the first project that I'm gonna talk about is um, focusing on that human's dimension research of coordinating approaches. And in response to these 2018 events, the state of Florida reinstituted the harmful algal bloom task force and created a blue-green algae task force essentially to determine the best methods and priorities for managing harmful algal blooms in the state. And so prior to um, these two task forces meeting, we created um, the Harmful Algal Bloom and hosted the Harmful Algal Bloom State of the Science Symposium in Florida. And the sole purpose of this was to do those coordinated approaches and really to get the research community and the management community in the same space physically, um, which I think we all can agree since COVID, you know, being in the same physical space is extremely important just to be able to have some of these really complex and necessary conversations, but to really break down what the current state of the science for these harmful algal blooms were. 
uh, to facilitate that information exchange and networking, and then to identify those data gaps and management gaps for moving the science forward and hopefully having effective management plans. So we broke it down into five different sessions for the algal blooms. And for each of these sessions, we addressed what we know, what we think we know, and what we need to know. And while we did focus specifically on Corenia brevis and cyanobacteria, the microcystis species, it's recognized that harmful algal blooms in general, even though there is a diversity of species and bloom forming species, and that the, you know, there's biophysical factors um, differ greatly, there are some umbrella um, similarities. And so what I'm going to be showing you now is the research priorities for the harmful algal blooms in general. And I'm not going to read the whole thing for you. It's really just to show you this alignment between the, you know, the research community needs and then the management needs. So for bloom initiation, development, and termination, it's really recognizing that we don't have any idea what causes a bloom to terminate. Um, and then when a bloom does end, what happens? And what exactly are the role of nutrients in bloom initiation, development, and termination in these various stages? And um, you know, understanding all of those triggers as part of the process. For bloom prediction and modeling, we recognized that we really need to get a better handle on the influence of point source versus non-point sources of pollution. For bloom detection and monitoring, is making sure that there is a greater um, sort of comprehensive, non-overlapping um, monitoring, but that that monitoring needs to be high resolution. That uh, monitoring water bodies once a month really isn't going to allow you to see these specific triggers that were identified as needs in the initiation, development, and termination. For mitigating and controlling harmful algal blooms, um, recognizing that we needed to not only conduct studies on these new technologies, but that we also really need these watershed scale restoration activities that are gonna influence blooms. And then lastly, for public health, under having a better improved knowledge of short and specifically long-term impacts to these blooms. And it's important to note that Throughout the entire workshop, a common theme that kept arising, even though it wasn't a general session, was this need for communications. And because of the diversity of harmful algal bloom species, the complexity of the factors, and the you know, data gaps, um, it makes communicating with the public particularly challenging. But there's a recognition that successful outreach and communication can mitigate harmful algal bloom impacts. And so, this community together decided that they needed a better social science understanding of what have information the public wants, how do they want to get it, and then what are individual and community values. Um, because even if we are able to convey and get the message to the public, if it doesn't align with their values, they're not likely to undertake the necessary behavior changes to um, reduce the impacts to public, social, and economic um, impacts and health. So the next project focuses on outreach and education, and this really focuses on that last piece, the values portion of communities and individuals. And we conducted a survey um, looking at the perceptions of water quality and harmful algal blooms in Florida, and we used a really unique audience for this. We um, targeted the overall extension agent um, advisory committees. And so every extension agent in the state of Florida has an advisory committee. These are grassroots people who by definition are informed and engaged public, but um, they have sort of the, the pulse of the local community. And so we wanted to identify what their perceptions were of um, water quality and harmful algal bloom management so that we can have targeted local scale management strategies and improve the outreach and communication efforts at the local community scale to an audience that we know is really impactful at the local level. Um, this is just to showcase that even though it's an advisory committee, they do come from all facets of 
um, the community. So 28% of them consider themselves to be general citizenry. We had members of business, government, nonprofit, academia. And again, a diversity across extension program areas. And this is important because while they're an engaged community, it doesn't generally mean that they have in their day-to-day -day life have any knowledge or expertise in water quality or harmful algal blooms. They are just a member of an advisory committee. So overall, when we're talking about sort of just general beliefs and opinions in water quality, um, water quality is a primary environmental issue for this audience in Florida. And they recognize that clean water is important to Florida's identity, but also that there is this perception that water quality, both in coastal and fresh water, is degraded. And this is consistent with other survey work for Floridians. Um, and there's this need or this perception that water quality does need improving and that everyone at each scale has a role to play in water quality improvement. So from the individual perspective, local communities to the state. And this is really important when you're talking about behavior change because need, people need to have ownership and feel a that there is a need for that change, but also that they have a role in being able to make a difference through behavior change. When we asked them what their motivators were for improving uh, water quality, the top two motivators were impacts on wildlife and, habit and fish habitat and impacts on public health, which means that when we're communicating to the public about why we should be improving water quality, we need to make sure that we're talking to them in a way that resonates with them as what's important. And that's essentially protection of the environment and public health. Um, when we ask them about what their preferred management strategy was, and this is, again is that PCM, it's part of the response management plan, uh, prevention overwhelmingly was voted as the primary um, preferred management strategy. And this is despite the fact that in the definition provided to them, says that this is prevention is long term and has not been proven to be successful for harmful algal blooms. Um, that being said, prevention usually requires nutrient management strategies. And so this is an overwhelming want and need from this community. And this tells us two things, is that people want to see nutrient reductions um, and foresee that as a means of improving water quality, but that there's also a hesitation for um, control and spending more money in mitigation. So if we are going to be putting money and time and resources into control strategies, we really need to do a good job in communicating that to the public and what that means and why they think it's going to be effective. We asked them um, about their willingness to pay for these nutrient reduction projects, seeing as um, they were sort of the primary control strategy. And we found that really there was no preference. It didn't matter how we got the nutrient control. Um, participants really were generally willing to participate and pay to conduct any one of these nutrient reduction projects, which goods, because that means that we are able to tailor these nutrient reduction prevention strategies for local watersheds, local aquatic systems, um, addressing the specific point and non-point sources of pollution and to the HAB species of concern. Finally, we conducted um, a structural equation model to determine sort of what factors influence that willingness to pay. Um, and we only included those factors that were statistically significant. And so I think first and foremost, what you'll note is maybe some of those demographic factors that are missing from this model. And from my mind, one of the things that really struck me was that um, geography or location of where these residents resided within the state was not statistically significant, which means that regardless of whether or not a person resided in a coastal county, either Gulf Coast or Atlantic Coast, or inland, um, that didn't influence their willingness to pay, which means that water quality and harmful algal blooms really is a state is perceived as a statewide issue. And ultimately, we found that um, 
gender and the perception of harmful algal blooms, essentially that they are getting worse over time, is the strongest predictor of willingness to pay, but that other um, things such as perception of water quality and that perceived control also influence individuals' willingness to pay. So as a takeaway, we know that water quality is a primary concern and that outreach and education is still necessary and is a major means of mitigating the impacts and that respondents show positive attitudes and perceived behavioral control in the ability to improve water quality. Um, and that preference really is to those prevention strategies and that there really doesn't matter what that nutrient reduction strategy is as long as it's going to cause um, is part of the management plan. And that perceptions about harmful algal blooms, water quality and perceived control influence the willingness to pay. So again, mitigation and management needs to have strategic messaging and communication um, built into um, these efforts in order to get public buy-in and acceptance. The last project that I'm gonna talk about builds again on this risk communication. And the Harmful Algal Bloom Task Force, um, after their first year, they created a list of priority recommendations. And part of that was to develop a communication strategy for red tides in the state. And so we did a, a variety of methodologies. And what I'm gonna be focusing on is the, met, um, the results that we got from a series of focus groups. And the focus groups, the stakeholder audience for this was the management community, so natural resource managers and public health managers, as well as the business and hospitality industry. And overall, what they found was that, um, and this was sort of across the board, regardless of our stakeholder, was that the primary concern is to protect the public health without amplifying those secondary economic and social risks. And that we need a communication cycle um, that matches sort of the different needs based off of where we are in that bloom cycle. And one of the major um, recognitions is that we need to strengthen those communication networks. And so hopefully you're seeing a link between these three projects and the need to incorporate these human dimensions and social science research into an effective management st um, strategy. And that communication really needs to be two-way and can't rely on the traditional one-way top-down information if we're going to be able to empower individuals to mitigate their risks to themselves and their communities through behavioral intent. Information really needs to be localized, um, site-specific. Um, as the Lake Watch program always says, um, you know, what's the most important water body in the state of Florida? And it's always my water body. It's the same thing when it comes to harmful algal blooms. They don't care where harmful algal blooms are unless it's at the location that they want to be visiting that day or where they're living or where they're, um, you know, their business is. And so making that information as local as possible and simplifying it. Um, we found that most of the state agencies are trying to communicate to everyone at once using the same um, communication tools, but we need to recognize that harmful algal bloom managers, the scientific community, politicians, and the public have different needs in terms of what that information is, and that our communication modes need to speak to those different audiences. Um, also recognizing the need for accurate and timely information. Um, Unfortunately, with many of the agencies where the information that they disseminate, it has to get approved before that they can put it out there. But if people are going to make timely information as to what beach they're going to go to or where they're going to eat or whether or not they're going to go kayaking, they need the most timely information as possible. And that's not always in line with um, agency communication strategies. And then finally, um, Provide behavioral recommendations so that people can make the decision for themselves with the best available information as to what they feel comfortable and um, what activities they feel comfortable engaging in and making those public health and personal health decisions for themselves. Um, providing that balance of health and economy and positive messaging. And then streamlining access to consumer friendly information. So ultimately what we found is that a red tide communication plan will need to balance accuracy with empathy. 
need to balance um, information with empowerment, giving people the, you know, the capacity and the tools to make those decisions for themselves, and then be comprehensive and place specific. So we recognize that harmful algal blooms are complex and that we have a diversity of species, aquatic systems, all of which have different um, biological, chemical, and physical factors associated with them. But if we're going to be managing them effectively, we have to consider human dimensions research to be part of uh, the management process. And so with that, I want to thank um, my all of my colleagues and funding agencies who helped to make these research projects successful and these extension projects successful. And with that, I will take any questions if I have time. <laughs> yeah, let's give a round of applause, Dr. Krinsky. All right, so I know some of you are there on Zoom that are normally in the room. I'm like, I don't know about you guys, but like I'm literally shivering, but maybe it's like <laughs> in blood here. But um, so we'll go to the room first. Any questions for Dr. Krinsky? And then we'll go to Zoom. Yeah, from MAE, what do you got? It was like on one of the earlier slides. I just saw that there was like a wide range of like predicted amount of species from like 30,000 to a million. I was wondering if you have any like insight on to like why the spread is so great. Um, I think it's because, I mean, I, I, there aren't that many taxonomists <laughs> out there anymore. And so basically, I, I mean, you can go into any aquatic environment, especially these extreme environments. And if you're willing to look, you will probably find <laughs> a novel species. Um, that's actually one of the needs that we recognize is that we need to build a, a new cohort of taxonomists <laughs> out there because it's kind of a dying field. Um, but it's really important when you're talking about managing them because they all do react sort of differently. Yeah, it's like when you go to the rainforest, people mm -hmm. finding new species everywhere. You know, you, there's just there's a lot of diversity we haven't yet to discover. Yeah. <clears throat> so from the Zoom, we've got Kat. Kat asks, can you expand more on how you selected the local extension agents where we can find our local agent? And are they considered the IFSC grant local extension agent? Okay, so local um, extension agents. So the, the population that I used for my survey was not the actual extension agents themselves, but it was their advisory committee members. And so how we recruited them is we sent an email to the entire extension agent listserv um, requesting them to send their advisory committee contact information to me. So certainly not a, a comprehensive sample, but we, we ended up getting 1400 names. So, it was, you know, pretty good. In terms of how you find your local extension agent, every county in the state of Florida has an extension office. It's part of the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. So if you just look up, you can go into the directory, directory.ifis.ufl.edu, and you can find your local county extension office. Um, and then sort of what program area your extension agents will have will be very dependent on the county and what the needs are for the county and the resources that that county has. And yes, many, though not all, of your county um, extension offices will have a Sea Grant agent. And that Sea Grant extension agent is responsible for providing local or regional outreach um, and extension programming that's really specific to that county and that community and the needs of that community. Lisa, I have a question. You mentioned, you know, this when you did the sur <clears throat> surveys of what people wanted to see, like prevention, mitigation. And obviously, you know, everyone wants prevention. It's like we want the kind of these magical things um, sometimes. And so do you, did you add, like, were people optimistic? You said that you told them, like, prevention is expensive and it often doesn't work and it, like, takes all this buy-in. Um, did I don't know if you pulled them on their sort of feel like, are they optimistic about the future of, of like mitigating algal blooms or reducing or prevent, preventing we algal didn't. blooms? The closest we got to that was that question that I showed about sort of who do you think can have a role to play? And it, you know, my feeling is, is that because they thought, you know, that individuals, local community and, you know, the state can have a role to play that they foresee some improvement in water quality. Um, it would be my understanding, or I guess I interpret it if, you know, if they didn't think individuals can have any role, then that they wouldn't have agreed with that statement. So 
there has to be some sentiment that, yeah, we can see improvements over time. But we did see in its data, I didn't show that there was a very strong perception that water quality over the last 10 years, um, and we, we asked about every water body, you can think of, you know, springs or oceans or bays, they overall thought that they were um, degraded as compared to 10 years ago. Interesting. Any other questions from the room? Oh, I have one more. Yeah. So on the map that you had where you're like outlining the different like species of Florida, it didn't yeah. seem like there were too many on the Atlantic coast. It seems like it was mostly like isolated to the panhandle and then around the Gulf and a little bit up. Is that mostly due to like water temperature of the Atlantic compared to the Gulf or what other environmental factors influence that? So we do have um, algae blooms on the Atlantic, they tend to be more in the estuaries and bays rather than the actual ocean itself. And that largely has to do with, um, you know, circulation patterns. We got the Gulf Stream, and so that's going to just sort of transport anything. And you're, the only accumulation that we really have in terms of algal biomass is the sargassum. And so that's that large seaweed that we often see floating on our southeast beaches. And that's a not not a toxic forming species, but it is harmful in that it can lead to sort of economic impacts. So, um, yeah, it's more a um, you know circulation. So, there's a question. I'm, <clears throat> I'm not sure you have an answer for this one, but Karthik from the chat asks, "How sustainable is the use of algae and wastewater treatments?" I'm not sure if you look at you know algal. Um, so, or wetland systems for wastewater treatment? Yeah, it's not my area of expertise, but I do know, um, you know, there are quite a few communities in Florida that are using what they're, they're referred to as algal turf scrubbers. And essentially what it is, is you just imagine sort of this really large concrete slab <laughs> and they just drizzle their waste, like seawater, uh, stormwater on it and allow it, it natural algal populations to grow up. And that natural algae will um, remove the nutrients from the stormwater as it sort of slowly through um, this gravity, you know, fed. And then after, you know, a couple of weeks or however long, they'll scrape the algae, they'll throw it into um, the landfill and they'll start that process all over. And so there are natural solutions using algae. Um, there's also the, you know, the huge stormwater treatment areas and stuff, which although there's plants, they also rely on algae for natural nutrient remediation. So not my area of expertise, but it is successful in certain areas. All right, and just a, com a comment from the chat um, about how how useful and insightful the talk was. Thank you. And just uh, thinking about the red tide conversation on social media and how it's going to be important to think about accuracy and empathy going forward. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any last questions from the room here? YouTube is characteristically quiet, so I got nothing on YouTube, <laughs> but we appreciate you out there in the virtual realm. So thank you so much, Dr. Krimsky. One more round of applause. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, and uh, see you next.